uh, this model, right? And this in this way, you can have you have both a rhetoric and actually a, fact, a, a factual way to speak with uh, policymakers, and of course, do all what you would do with for, with sorry with uh, with uh, an estimated model. Among those things, we have forecasts. This uh, uh, need to try to bridge uh, agent-based models and real observed data is something that, as you can see from this list, which is, I mean, uh, there are a lot of papers in here, is something that has been uh, in the uh, community felt as important. In fact, a lot of people have started working on it and doing a lot of uh, very good works about both validation, so trying to measure the ability of models to reproduce empirical data, and also about estimation. So after the very first um, contribution by Gillian Winker from yeah, 2015, 17, so a few years from few years on, we got um, people working on this um, estimation problem, right? So we have maximum likelihood by Giri, we have uh, we have synodial metal moments, we have variation estimation, and, and so on and, and so forth. So what's the problem? Well, not the problem, but what, what do we want to uh, add on this literature? Well, one important thing is that, again, uh, most of these, um, of these papers do look at, so they do propose methods, and they uh, apply this method usually to small models, and that's exactly what we did as well with uh, Matteo, for example, right? So we're concerned with uh, finding ways to estimate computational models, and we were, uh, we didn't, we didn't went, I mean, we used simple models to do that, also to highlight a bit these methods. Well, what we want to do in this paper, what we did in this paper, was to estimate a fully fledged uh, macro, medium scale macro region based model. This is a kind of proof of principle, right? Also, a rhetorical point. So, uh, these methods can be used, and this method in particular, of course, which I'm uh, looking at, but uh, of course, I, I, I'm quite sure that also the other methods, since this works also, for example, maximum likelihood is going to work, I suppose. Um, do work also when we take up the challenge to uh, apply this estimation method to something a bit more complex. And when I mean complex is about how the simulation, how the output works, right? So whether, how, how, how much time we need to simulate, how much, how the, the simulation behave, whether they are ergodic and so on and so forth. Um, while we did that, so as I was mentioning at the beginning, while we were looking at estimating fully-fledged macro medium scale and macro based model, we also came up with, I think, a nice um, improvement on the old Bayesian method. So we're going to use, of course, Bayesian method, and it's going to be a, a bit of an improvement with respect to the one that we described with Matteo. So this is estimation, okay? So we want to do it on a, on a nice, uh, I mean, nice, it's a medium scale agent-based model. The second part, um, of our paper is about forecast. So basically, once we get the estimated model, we're gonna use it for forecasting. And again, this is, of course, not, uh, you don't need to have an estimated model to use this forecasting methodology, but it makes sense to use forecast on an estimated model, logically. But of course, again, it's not, it's not compulsory. Um, so what is forecasting? Well, forecasting is something that will allow us to make predictions about future outcome. Uh, so the model, once we have a forecasting method, we can use this model to uh, evaluate the state of the economy in terms of its likely future evolution, right? So, for example, whether it's going to grow, the output's going to grow tomorrow or not. So, we know that agent-based models are quite good in producing endogenous business cycle uh, and producing possibly endogenous crisis and uh, endogenous as, as I already mentioned, very good in producing some nice stylized effect, both at the micro level and the macro level. When once you have the forecasting method on, then what you can do is not just say, well, this model is telling me that there are business cycles and they work in this and that way. What you can also say is, according to the model, we are in this point of the business cycle. So tomorrow, uh, the, the output, for example, will grow or uh, so have a positive growth or it will have a negative growth, growth, right? So it gives you, again, 
we can use the model to say at what point we are in the business cycle, what the model has to say about what's going to happen tomorrow. And this in the future uh, is going to be, I think, interesting, especially in, in the light of uh, the ability of these kind of models to, um, to uh, produce endogenous crisis. So one thing uh, that I will show you just one slide and mention it also uh, later on, I'm doing with Alessandro Cagliani, is trying to uh, see whether these kind of models can actually try and kind of predict the event of a crisis, and in particular, whether it could, it could have predicted the uh, financial crisis, right? So it would be nice to have this, to use this kind of models in order to uh, have some, um, some, some early warning uh, kind of signals from these models, looking at out there, what's gonna happen tomorrow. Moreover, forecasting performances of models can also be used to compare different models. Right, so uh, this is also something uh, which is included in the project with Kayani. But um, I mean, the DSG models, just to name the, of course, the main uh, mainstream macro model, do have way of forecasting. So they do expect to have something uh, similar from agent based models, I suppose. Right, so it would be nice to be able to do that and possibly compare uh, different models, even between different model methodology. So this forecasting is completely, um, let's say, I mean, I can compare the forecast made with this agent-based model with forecasts made with other models. In this paper in particular, we're gonna go this, do the simplest possible thing, which is comparing the agent-based model forecast with the VAR forecast, okay? And of course, instead of the VR, we could have another agent-based model, we could have uh, DSG model. So the forecasting literature, quite uh, surprisingly, uh, in AB models, literature is, uh, is very scarce. There's been something in financial literature and uh, very little in macroeconomic uh, literature. So what we're going to do here is to um, give you, to propose, to describe a method which uh, can be used to make forecasts actually from any model. And the reason is that what we're going to use is simply the artificial time series. So basically, as you will see, what we need to make to use this forecasting method are just time series produced by your model. Okay, so it's very general. You just uh, plug it on uh, whatever model you want to use. Of course, if you can't do any with that particular model, you can't do any analytical or different way of forecasting, then you can use this kind of forecasting uh, tool. So it's uh, non-parametric. We use simulation uh, simulations to mm, basically characterize the output of the model and then use that characterization to uh, forecast uh, future, uh, future behavior of the economy uh, according to the model. So this was the introduction. Hopefully I gave you some ideas about what's going to happen next. Uh, this is the outline of the rest of the presentation. So I'm going to show you very quickly the model. Uh, so I'm not going to show you any equation or anything, just trying to give you the intuition about the model. And the idea here, since the model is not really central in terms of what I want to convey, is not about, um, I'm just going to give you the intuition, in the sense I just want to tell you that the model is an agent this model with all the uh, many of the perks and all of the of the problems that you have in agent-based modeling, right? So it's a fully computational model with a lot of agents, a lot of uh, uh, interaction and stuff like that. Then we're going to go into the estimation method, of course, estimation results, then the forecasting method and the forecasting results. So let's get into the... Uh, to the uh, model. So this is uh, a model which is basically coming from the line of Katz model by Delligati and Gallegati. It comes from uh, the work we have done also in Catholic University and uh, uh, which have been, uh, uh, so models that, uh, yeah, basically come from this kind of uh, modeling family. 
Many of you do know what I'm talking about. If you don't, again, I'm going to give you just an overview, a very uh, rapid overview about the model, but you can find the model described a bit better in the working paper that's online on Shasifi. So what do we have in this model? Well, we have a set of some agents, of course. So we have households. Uh, we have two types of, uh, of you know, firms, consumption good firms and a capital good firm, uh, firms. And we have a bank and a government. These agents are going to interact on a set of markets. In particular, we're going to have consumption goods market, capital goods market, labor market, and credit. These markets are going to be um, um, characterized by search, a kind of a type of search and matching mechanism. So um, basically what's going to happen is that households are going to look for goods uh, in the market from firms. However, since they have a limited amount of, um, they have a, a limited ability to observe firms, they are going to be able only to observe a subset of firms. Okay, so they're going to buy from the cheapest subset firm in their subset. And this gives rise to the search and matching. So basically in this kind of markets, what you can have is a supply, so unsold goods, uh, which, uh, so there can be unsold goods and uh, unsatisfied demand at the same time. Okay, so it might happen that uh, some goods are not matched, some supply is not matched with uh, the, the, the demand. And this is true for uh, consumption goods, capital goods, and labor market. Okay, of course, each one in their own uh, for their own good. And this implies that for the labor market, for example, that you have you do have some um, some friction unemployment, right? So you can have some vacancies and still some people uh, some open vacancies and some people unemployed. Um, this type of market has the characteristic also of being quite noisy in terms of what's going to happen to each individual firm in each, in each, uh, in each uh, period. So that um, gives rise to uh, some uh, mistakes by firms who will behave, as you would see, uh, with some heuristics, and therefore you can have overproduction, bankruptcies, and all this kind of stuff. The only uh, market that does not have a uh, search and matching is the credit market, and that's simply because we have just one bank, right? So all firms that need some uh, some loans that are going to go to the one bank in the economy and they're going to ask for uh, the, the, the loan. Um, this loan is going to be supplied by the bank but on an individual basis which means that basically each the bank is going to look at the firm that's asking the loan is going to uh, observe the leverage of this firm so basically we're gonna, uh, the, the, the ratio between debt and, and, and equity so how much this firm is indebted, which is a proxy for fragility of the firm, and then is going to supply an amount of credit, which is a function of the leverage. The higher the leverage, the higher fragility, the lower is the amount of credit supplied, and is going to apply a price on interest rate, which is instead positively correlated with the leverage. So the higher is the leverage, the higher is the fragility, the higher is the interest rate imposed on, on, on for the loan, okay? Um, so the main mechanism here is basically that these firms are going to behave, are going to have to sell on this quite noisy market. They're going to not be able to, always able to produce the right amount. Often they're going to be, they're going to lose some money because they overproduce and this will give rise to different kinds of firms, a distribution of leverages. Different firms are going to have different levels of fragility. So, this is basically how the model works. I'm gonna just gonna go uh, back to the slides and go ahead um, with a more bit of detail. So K firms, so capital firms use only labor to produce capital goods. So we have the, instead consumption good firms are using capitals and labor to produce uh, consumption goods. Uh, as I said, both type of firms use bank loans. And when, as I already described how these bank loans are supplied by the bank, Households supply in elastically one unit, unit of labor, consume, and of course, saves as a consequence of the consumption decision. Uh, the bank collects deposit and extends, as I said already, uh, loans to firms. And then we have a fiscal authority, which is extremely simple. What it does is simply to collect taxes on income and pay unemployment subsidies. So basically here what we have is some, a very simple 
government which has a counter cyclical kind of uh, behavior, automatic counter cyclical behavior by, uh, of course, uh, as kind of obvious, by collecting taxes on income and paying unemployment subsidies on needed. Here you have a bird eye view of the model with all the, the, the type of firms. Uh, so this are, I mean, this, these are the connections between the, 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 the different agents. So on the labor market, households provide labor services, which are then bought by pay firms uh, and, and consumption firms, and the same is for the rest. I mean, it's a, uh, in terms of structure, it's not that um, uh, complicated model. Of course, if you have questions, please uh, uh, let me know. Um, so I already talked about the search and matching and the consequences of this uh, search and matching. So this, in this uh, market, it's difficult, especially for firms, to find the right uh, amount of good to, be, to, to sell and the price. How do they do that? I'm going to do it in the next slide. First, I'm just going to talk about this part here, which is also uh, part of the details of the model. So the government already told you, collect taxes and uh, pay unemployment subsidies. We have an, another also uh, law of motion for wages. So this is kind of top uh, from um, top down, let's say. So we just uh, apply this law of motion to have some kind of Phillips curve in the model and having nominal, uh, possibly nominal uh, variable move together with this wage. So what we have is that the wage is going to move up when the labor market is, um, is tight and it's going to move down when the labor market is loose. Okay, so we have uh, the wage reacting somehow to, um, to, the, to, the, to the conditions in the labor market. It's also uh, fairly standard and also we implemented in a very extremely simple way. Um, okay, behavior. Again, this is just uh, uh, an idea, but the point is that consumers decide how, to, uh, how much to consume based on an estimation of their permanent income. So they look at past income and they're going to use this, uh, this idea to decide how much to consume. Firms set prices and production based on past individual demand and the relation between past individual price and past price index. And the bank, as I said, they decide credit supply interest rate to each firm based on leverage. So of course we have no rationality here. Everything is bounded rational, boundary rational. Every agent is boundary rational. They try to survive in a fairly complicated uh, model using some very some so, uh, better fairly complicated environment using some very simple um, heuristics. So we get now to the estimation part. Uh, so in this model we have 28 parameters. Right, so that's a lot uh, for this application. Uh, and of course, uh, we would like to increase this number. We're gonna estimate only 11 of these parameters, okay? Uh, why is that? Well, that's because one of the bottlenecks of this kind of, uh, uh, this kind of methods, in general, the estimation of agent-based models is the exploration of the parameter space. And clearly, the higher the number of parameters, the harder becomes the problem. Okay, so this is something I'm going to talk about a bit, and we're going to go use a shortcut with the justification that we want. To, so we're going to explore the space in a very simple way. There are much better and more complicated way. We're going to do, you do it in a simple way with the justification that we want to see how the method works. But again, this is, I think, uh, an, an open um, uh, path to take to for research trying to improve or at least apply methods that are actually already quite good in the literature to this uh, problem. So I'm going to, I mean, I didn't show you the parameters, so I didn't show you the, the, um, the, the equation, so you don't really know what's going on here, right? So of course, it's, these tables are just to give you an idea. So we have a set of parameters which are um, calibrated, possibly using some external data or using past experience, our own experience on how these models behave uh, to give uh, some, some sensitive, uh, some values that give sense, some sensible uh, output. Uh, and then we choose a set of parameters mainly um, concerning behavior. 
So as you can see, we have the memory parameter in consumption. So this is part of the, of the estimation of the permanent consumption equation, a wealth parameter in consumption. So how much of the wealth I'm going, uh, the consumers are going to use in their consumption. Quantity adjustment is about firms who need to adjust quantity, looking at the excess demand slash supply last uh, period, price adjustment, and so on. Okay. I mean, this is not super important for the moment because we're not really looking at the, at the model, but again, this is to give you the, to give you the flavor of what's, uh, uh, what's going on here. Again, the more parameters, the better. The more parameters we can estimate, the better. And this is kind of an obvious statement. Um, okay, so the estimation part. Now we get to the, um, to the part in which a bit more uh, about the method. Uh, so we want to estimate these 11 parameters. Let's just say that these 11 parameters can be written, I mean, denoted by this beta. So what do we have when we have an agent-based model? Well, we have a function that given the value of the parameters gives us some, okay? So this output is gonna be time series that we choose to extract from the model. In this case, we have n time series with t periods. Notice that here I'm actually jumping a bit of things. So here I'm, I'm, I'm actually assuming that there is ergodicity in this model and therefore, the output of the model does not depend on the random seed or on the, on the initial condition. We have an ergodicity test later on. Of course, this is a very important matter, which I'm just uh, cutting here for a matter of, of, of time, okay? So once we have the model, we have a function that takes some input parameters and gives us some output. And this output is, uh, for example, GDP, inflation, and whatever. In very broad terms, estimation one, the estimation procedure wants to compare and possibly get as close as possible the observed um, time series, so observed output, GDP, and artificial time series, okay? Since we do not have any way of uh, writing this F, what we need to do is to use numerical simulations. So doing this, so we have a model, which we represent here very simply with an F, and we want to find a parameter such that for some metric, which in this case is gonna be Bayesian estimation method, uh, artificial and observed output are uh, as close as possible. So we have two problems here. The first one is parameter space exploration. And this is something I already mentioned. This is a big problem. We're gonna do the simplest thing possible. The second thing is about once we have, I mean, given the space exploration, we need to characterize the behavior of the model relatively to the behavior of observed data given each beta i. So each possible parameter in the, in the, in the parameter space, each possible parameter combination in the parameter space. And what we're gonna do is simply to compute simulated likelihood and then using the prior a posterior probability. Exploring the parameter space, is a problem, why? Because it's very irregular. So at the beginning of this project, now a few years ago actually, we did start with an MCMC kind of, um, of, of, um, of algorithm, which was what we used on simpler model in, the, in a previous paper with Matteo in mind. Now in this model here, actually, it, uh, it turned out that the MCMC was often going down and get, getting stuck in local minima right, or maximum, whatever, so in local areas of high uh, posterity. And this is not good, of course. So we did cut here on, on, the, on the problem just by doing a brute force uh, exploration. So what we do is to extract 5,000 samples from the parameter space, and then we, from, for each of these samples, so you can imagine 5,000 beta i, each, of each beta i is a combination of, uh, of parameters, which have been chosen with the latent hyper, hypercube sampling function. And then we simulate for each of these uh, parameter combination, the model 20 times for 3000 periods. So just to um, hear the few numbers about how long that takes. This is very computation intensive. We have 100,000 simulation, 300 million periods, right? So this would take 113 days computation on my own computer at home. Uh, Likely we have a better computer in the, the department at the uh, complexity lab in economics, so we got it down to five days, but still it's quite a lot of, uh, of time, okay? Again, here we have a lot of things that could be done to improve this part, which is crucial, of course, this part of the estimation procedure. And this is something that uh, had been studied already 
in the literature, for example, Lamperti and, 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 uh, and co-authors did a very nice paper on uh, meta-modeling and, and so on. Okay, so this is something that, uh, I mean, uh, I think it ne needs to be kind of um, uh, put together with this uh, method. So what do we do once we have all our bit i? So this 5,000 bit i, we simulate the model and get a set for each of these bit i, some output. Okay, so we have y i is a matrix, so it's m simulated time series of length t. And what we can do, the first thing that, that we can do, and that's what we did with, the, with Matteo and Mike, was to, um, to estimate an m-dimensional density for the simulated time series. Okay, so we took the output of the model and applied the kernel density estimator to get a multivariate um, density characterizing for, for each yi. So for each beta i, we had a given uh, density. Okay. Now, this was not taking into account the fact that actually often in macroeconomics you have a lot of time structure, so you have a lot of autocorrelation. So in this paper here, and this is the line I was telling you about at the beginning, this is the improvement we did uh, on the uh, former estimation uh, method. We use the joint, uh, the joint uh, multivariate uh, density between yt and yt minus one. So now it's two times m dimensional density, which characterize the behavior of the model also in the relationship between the variables yesterday and the variables today. Okay, and of course, this is possible to choose a different number of luck. So in the uh, part where I was talking about, I was talking about so the, the new project I'm doing with Alessandro, for example, we use three luck. So instead of having just one luck here, we're gonna have a joint uh, density of uh, yt, yt minus 1, yt minus 2, and yt minus 3. How do we compute our m dimensional, uh, m dimensional, sorry, 2 times m dimensional density using kernel density estimation? This, of course, has its own problem because it's a non parametric um, estimator, so you need a lot of data and so on. But it seems to work uh, quite nicely, at least for uh, in this model and also in simple models that we have experimented with. So we have in the um, appendix of the paper, we have some simple, um, uh, the application of this method, uh, this estimation method uh, to simple models and to just to see whether it works. Okay, we have some interesting uh, alternative out there as well. So now what do we have? Well, we have the, a characterization, so basically the, this joint density for each bit i of the outcome. Now, let's say that we have a an, uh, an, uh, set of observed data, right? What we can do now is to use our density, which is again a density function, which is again specific to each beta i, and compute the density of observed data. Okay, so when we change beta i, of course, y hat t and y hat, sorry, y hat is going to stay constant. So once we change beta i, we're basically changing. The, how this density works, so we get a different uh, value for our uh, multivariate uh, density. Okay. Um, just to give you an example, even if I think I'm running out of time, let's say let's say that we have a very simple model, univariate in this case. So let's take out all the the um, let's say complicating stuff. Let's say that this model produce had we tried three type three, three values for the parameters: beta one, beta two, beta three. So this density, this is the kernel density estimator for each of the outputs coming from the model with the different parameters. What we can do is to compute the density of a given observed point under each model. And of course, we're going to get a different density given that the density is, uh, depends on the particular output, which in turn depends on the, um, on, on the parameter. Okay, so we have now this guy here, which is basically the, um, the density of our observed data under each uh, configuration of the model. Configuration means each value of the parameters. So what we can do now is to compute the likelihood using a prior, we can compute the posterior. So that's our estimation method, okay? We can compute this posterior and then we, can, uh, we have a distribution of a density over our parameter space, the ones, of course, that we have selected in our 
um, obscuration uh, phase. And we can use the average of the expected value, the mode or whatever, to as a point estimate, or we can just use this distribution to simulate the model with different uh, values of the point. So basically we have this distribution, which is what we were looking for. Now, we apply this method to US data. So what does it mean? It means that y hat t is now composed, uh, is, is made of uh, real GDP, single component, real gross investment, real consumption, the mean inflation rate and employment rate. And what we do, we compute, we use the model to compute this posterior on our parameters using this uh, five time series. Okay, so we're gonna produce, uh, from the model, we're gonna produce the artificial counterpart of this time series, computing the, the joint density, using these densities to compute the, the, the density of each of the, of the observed data, and this way we can compute the posterior of the die. I'm gonna be fast with the estimation results. Uh, of course, here we have the priors, which are uniform. I didn't say that, but was in the previous slide, and we have a mode, which we use in this application as point estimate. Uh, of course, you could also use the, the, the distribution. Um, so I believe I'm gonna, I'm running out of time. So I'm gonna go a bit fast because I want to talk about uh, forecasting as well. So now we have estimated our model. What can we do? Well, we can look at whether these estimates are reliable. So we can do some post-estimation tests. The first post-estimation estimation test is this ergodicity test. We simulate the model with the estimated parameters, see whether the time series produced by the same set of parameters, but different seeds, come from the same, um, the same data general process. And this is the very simple what what is test. And here you have results that seems to go in the direction of ergodicity of the model. So these are the rejection rates. So if uh, the null hypothesis of, of, um, of the test, which is the different time series produced by the model with different uh, seeds do come from the same data general process, then this rejection rate should be at least close or smaller than uh, the alpha you choose for your test. We also do some, uh, some, uh, some pseudo estimation uh, exercise and we, so basically we simulate the model and use the simulations to estimate. So we use the simulation as observed data, pseudo observed time series. So we estimate our model using those uh, observed, pseudo observed time series. In theory, we should get always this, the right the, the value of the back, uh, the of parameters used to produce the pseudo observed time series. Instead, we had 86%, but yet we think that this is an FF number uh, of uh, correct estimations. This is the comparison with the, between the model, the estimated model, and the observed uh, data. These are just unconditional distributions of our time series. And of course, we can do the same with our. Um, uh, looking at the moments. Okay, so let me get to the forecasting. These are the, um, the inputs response function that I'm not going to talk about. Uh, forecasting. Now, in this case, instead, we're going to use a very similar idea, actually. So we're going to use candidate density estimator to, uh, as to generate forecast using uh, simulation models. Um, so what we do essentially is to simulate the model many, many times uh, to determine the statistical behavior, so the, to characterize the behavior of the model. Of course, here we are choosing one set of parameters, right? So we have, we did estimate our model of somehow, again, these are not, you don't need an estimated model, you just can have a calibrated model. So you do have chosen though um, a set of parameters. Given the set of parameters, you simulate the model many times. And this allows us to characterize the behavior of the model. Okay, why do we, do we think that the forecasts are important? Well, I already talked about that. That's because in this way we can compare and evaluate models. So, and we can, for example, ask uh, the model whether uh, the crisis is coming or, or not. And this is something I'm gonna try on in this uh, simple application. Again, we do do, we, we're, going, we're doing, we're using a very simple application. So we focus on output and investment. So our model, of course, do produce output investment. What we do, we simulate with the estimated set of parameters, uh, out the model many times and get out some a vectors or a, so a 
time series of simulated output and simulated investment. And we have y hat, which is going to be the observed output, the observed investment as earlier. Now, we simulate the model 192 times. Why 192? That's because we had 24 cores. So it's not just a number, weird number, it's just that it's divisible by 24. Okay, the point is just having many, um, many uh, simulations. We use, so we apply, so now we have, what do we have? From this 192 simulations, we have, uh, for each of these simulations, we have YT, which is composed of output investment. So what, what we can do is to use a KDE, so a kind of density estimator, to compute the joint density and um, the, the conditional density of this data. Okay, so what, what we do, we um, simply use the kernel density estimator to compute uh, the, this uh, conditional density, which basically is a function, numerical function, that gives us for each possible value of y t minus one, the density of y t. So that how likely is that y, a given value of y t is uh, realized, okay? This as simple as that, okay? So for each possible uh, y t, given y t minus one, we have a number that rep is rep represents the density of that, uh, of that possible outcome. So how do we use this? So again, this is simply produced by our kernel density estimator applied to our simulated uh, output, okay? So this, is, this F is characterizing the behavior of the model. How do we use this? Well, for each observation y t minus one, so we have a given time period y t minus one, in which we observe output and investment, we can compute for any possible value of y t, the density of y t, the condition to y t minus one. Okay, so what we need to do in practice is, let's say that we are in a given period and let's call the last observed uh, uh, output uh, and investment y t minus one ten. What we do is to select i possible values for next period or t period output and investment and for each of these values we compute this density. So what do we have at the end? Well we have a distribution. We have a distribution or density distribution on outcomes in t given the observation t minus one. Again, of course, the higher is this number, the better. Even if looking at how it works, actually, is, you don't need a very high number. Even in this case, we're going to use a very high number of uh, possible outcomes tomorrow. So hopefully this was clear. So what I'm saying is we use kernel density estimators to characterize the, how the model, the artificial data behave. Given this, so given the fact that now we can compute this, this numerical function in here, which is conditional density of a given number given another number right uh, we can do the same this exercise for each given observed uh, value on a set of possible outcomes tomorrow okay and we have a distribution and this distribution we can use to compute compute expected value but not only that of course we could compute mode the mode of the uh, distribution so this is a simple Univariate example, which hopefully uh, give you the intuition about what's going on. So let's say that we have observed y t minus one half. Okay, so this is our observed value. So given the model, we have this f, this function, and we apply this function with y one and y t minus one, giving us this density. Y two and y t minus one, given giving us this density, and so on and so forth. So basically, having many possible outcomes for t, right? So these are arbitrary, we can just choose whatever value. For each of these values, we get a density. And if these values are sensible, we get this nice distribution here. Of course, not this in particular, but we have a distribution that has um, some positive uh, density at one point. And we can compute then, using this distribution, the forecast for tomorrow. If we want to use the expected value, of course, in this case, the mode and the expected value are exactly the same. Okay, know that we could also compute, for example, the standard deviation here. We could do a lot of, of things. Okay, so our uh, forecasting method simply is about computing this F using KDE and then 
start for each observed value, compute this distribution, and then compute the expected value given by this distribution. What do we do? How do we apply this method? Well, we apply it, of course, using our agent-based model. Uh, we look at output gap investment gap in the US. We set I to 10,000. So we have a lot of different uh, possible. So 10,000 is the number of possible outcomes that we have in tomorrow's, uh, for tomorrow, right? So, uh, of course, in the application, this is bivariate, while this is univariate, but just to give you an idea. And then we have the data from uh, in the US from Q1 1948 to uh, Q4 2019. Using this data, we're able to produce forecasts that basically are um, made using the information from the model. So what is, uh, uh, how, how do we understand whether this is a good forecast or bad forecast? Well, we have, we just chose to, to use as a benchmark a VAR. So we estimate a simple VAR on output gap and investment gap uh, on US data, and then compute analytically the one period ahead forecast of the bar, which is of course very simple. What are the results? These are the results. Here you can see the output gap on the panel the, uh, above, and below you have the investment gap. The US data, so the actual realization of uh, output gap, for example, is the dashed blue line. The ABM forecast is the orange line, and the VR model is the uh, forecast is the uh, yellow line. So as you can see, the ABM is not too far. Of course, these are one period ahead forecast, so I mean, it shouldn't be too difficult. However, it's not too bad. Yet you can already see from a graphical um, inspection that what we have here is that, for example, uh, the, in this case here, the AB mod, ABM model has too little persistence, right, with respect to the bar. So the VR still uh, uh, fit better, so forecast better than the output gap. Now, this is a graphical uh, in, uh, inspection. We can also do this the same, we can ask the same question using some more uh, formal uh, method, right? So what we can do is to test the forecast accuracy, accuracy of the ABM model versus the VR model. And what we get, uh, we use the Diebold Mariano test. So the null of this test is that the two forecasting methods are equivalent. These two numbers are the, um, the test statistics for output gap and investment. And the test statistics should, in, under the null should follow a random normal, uh, a normal distribution, right? So a standard normal distribution. So these are clearly um, rejecting the null hypothesis of uh, equal accuracy for the two uh, forecasting methods. And the minus sign is, um, is uh, giving us actually, is, is favoring the VR. So the VR is still going better than the ABM, yet it's actually, I think, not too bad as result well because this four is not too bad being the uh, statistic uh, 1,96 that we were um, looking for, right? So it's not too far off, let's say. Maybe just this is just a story for ourselves. Um, uh, so, so, but it's it's not too bad. What is important though is that actually this can give us. So this is the first example of model valuation, right? So what I was talking, I was telling you about before was that uh, forecasts are useful to um, to uh, compare different models in terms of their forecasting accuracy. And here we have a third example. We have that the VR, the simple VR, actually outperforms the ABM. Well, one way of using this information is to try to build models that are closer to the VR, right? So, of course, if the um, aim of the model is to forecast, then you have models for any kind of uh, objective, of course. I'm not saying that any models should be able to forecast well, but if you want a model that is able to forecast uh, the future, the, the macroeconomic variables, then one way of uh, guiding the modeling uh, effort could be also to use this kind of data. This was one period ahead. Now I'm going to give you also the four period ahead, um, the four period ahead um, um, uh, forecast, and these are actually worse than the first period ahead, one period ahead. But this also opens uh, some some routes for for future research, as you would see. So. Um, 
what we want to do here is, I'm just going to go directly to the results to estimate our output and investment. Here I'm just showing output for period ahead. Now this figure here at first may seem a bit confused. It wasn't easy to make it clearer, but just if you look at it, this is just giving you um, free kind of information. I mean, it's giving you the actual behavior of output gap in the US from 2000 Q4 2010 to uh, Q4 um, 2019. Um, then we have actually, sorry, Q4 2018 in this case. Then we have the orange uh, line are the ABM forecast and the yellow lines are the diamonds are the VR forecast. So this basically are simply given, giving, just making an example, giving this observation here, the ABM is forecasting this path for the economy. The VR is, is forecasting this path for the economy. This doesn't look good. I agree with the, your thoughts right now. In fact, the ABM, but also the VR, are both telling us that the model, sorry, the economy should always get back to, uh, to the equilibrium. However, if you think about it, we're also using very little information to characterize the behavior of the model, right? So we're using just output that investment. So uh, the, the, the fact that they are not working that well was expected. Now we have two options for the future, and this is what I'm doing partially at least, I mean, actually not partially, I'm doing uh, with uh, Alessandro. Uh, we have two options for the future, change the model. Maybe the model is not right, that's uh, fair enough. And that's a way of, uh, of uh, let's say, realizing that the model is not right may, might also come from this, this forecast exercise or change and increase the number of uh, uh, forecast uh, of time series. I'm going to show you one slide later on about the project with, uh, with Alessandro. Another thing that I think is very interesting and maybe even more interesting because um, of the difficulty of having point forecasts, right? So point forecasts are a headache anyways. So what we could do is to use the fact that we have a distribution of, um, of possible outcomes tomorrow for each given observed uh, data point. Um, we can do some density forecast. What do I mean? Well, I'm just gonna go directly to example, univariate example. Instead of asking, what is the expected value of this distribution? I can ask, how big is this area, for example, in this distribution? Now, this particular area, if you uh, notice, is the uh, area including all outcomes that are lower, so tomorrow, output, let's say, lower than today. So basically here, what I'm doing is to compute the probability that uh, output will decrease tomorrow given the value of uh, y hat t minus one. So we have uh, a way to, um, this we call this density forecast, and we have a way to understand rather than the point, the number of tomorrow, the behavior of the, the more, um, I think, interesting because the point estimate again is very difficult but interesting uh, information about tomorrow. So for example what do we do here? Well we do exactly this. We compute for each time period we compute the density uh, associated so the, the cumulative density some of the density associated to negative change in output and investment joint tomorrow. So basically this line here is telling you the probability according to the model that given the uh, value of output gap and investment in T minus one, we're gonna have a value of output gap investment tomorrow, which is small. Okay, so this is the probability. And the nice thing is that this actually have some, uh, I mean, it's, it's increasing just be before the crisis. So this is just from 85 to 2000 and, and, and uh, so, uh, we use data up to Q4 2019, it's the probability that we're going to have a negative growth for output and investment joint. Okay, so it's speaking uh, just before uh, the crisis. Again, this is an example in the sense that uh, we're using two time series and uh, probably it's not the right time series. So just to finish, because I think I'm up, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, 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 I don't have time anymore. Uh, this is the project with Alessandro Cagliani. This is very preliminary. This is, as I was saying, about forecasting and 
uh, what we do is to, we want to do, we didn't do it yet, is to evaluate the ability of ABM, BSG, and VR to forecast the financial crisis. We change the model, so we use the Kayani et al. 2016 model, and we forecast output, investment, and loans. So this is, we are both changing the model, I'm taking my own advice as I gave before, so change the model and increase the number of, uh, of, of time series. Here we include also loans, which, are, which is a financial time series, which is likely to be important in terms of understanding the financial crisis. And we compute four periods ahead forecast condition on three lines, okay? All I, what I can give you now is this. So this is the, um, as you can see, is the, this, the, the blue line is the observed output gap from uh, Q, uh, what was it, Q3 2007, right? And the black lines are four periods ahead uh, actually, this uh, yeah, four period heads forecasts of uh, for coming from the model using the um, Kayani et al. model, um, starting each from each time period. Now, what's nice? So this is the reason why I'm I'm showing you this picture is that actually while the uh, the similar picture I showed you before using uh, our model and the VAR was quite off, what you can see here is that actually. This model is able, using also loans, or is able to uh, actually predict not only a path back to the equilibrium when the output gap is positive, but also in some cases, path that takes the model, the, the economy further away from the equilibrium when we are down the, in, the, in the deep crisis. So it's not just you know, going up, back up as in the, in, the, in the previous one, right? So here we do have something that recall that that seems to work a bit better um, and possibly might be the model but of course also the time of type of time series we're using might be uh, might be different and might be uh, i mean the fact that we use also some financial time series might be good i have just one slide of conclusions and i can actually skip it because uh, it's not that uh, important i mean hopefully you got this so we estimate the medium scale agent based model we use this to make uh, in sample and out sample forecast. I didn't speak about out sample forecast, but they are kind of similar. And um, uh, yeah, so these are the two methods that uh, I'm uh, this, I described. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Jacob, for a very interesting presentation. I'm opening the floor for questions and discussions. We have time for very few questions so if you have any please raise your hand or write it in a chat box i will try to read it okay yes marco go ahead with your question um Hi, uh, hi Jacob, thanks for the talk. So I have a question about the uh, sampling. I was uh, a little bit surprised that just, uh, you know, brute force uh, grid, I assume, exploration worked better than uh, 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 MCMC. Mm -hmm. uh, is that because it's quite tricky to come up with a good rule to update parameters, to, you know, basically update parameters as you go uh, along with the MCMC? Is that, is that the challenge? Uh, because if it's if it's done properly, it should give you an unbiased sampling from the equilibrium. Right. Um, yes. I mean, the problem is uh, is that the problem is that the main problem is that uh, it's the the the, the posterior is really rough. So basically, you have a lot of local minima up and downs, and it's very difficult to have the right calibration that is not too exploring and not too exploiting. Let's say. In the in the MCMC, we did try it. Of course, I mean, I'm sure that uh, it could have been done better. I mean, uh, it's a, but we did try the MCMC kind of algorithm on this model, and we didn't get uh, nice results from it. So okay, I, I suppose that the problem is exactly that. You could probably use something more sophisticated, like uh, you know, uh, online changes of the parameters and stuff like that. I'm sure that there are a lot of things that could be done in that direction. Silvan, please welcome with your comment. Yeah, uh, so, so um, I, it's really nice to see the progress on this, uh, on this stuff that we've been, you know, been talking about it for a few years now. Um, I'm not at all 
Um, I'm not at all surprised about this MCMC thing, and actually that's what my comment is about. Um, on the front end, what you do seems to be quite similar essentially to what uh, Sandra and I tried to do with the uh, Euros model, with the kind of, uh, you know, you take a Latin hypercube or something, you know, some designer experiment, you sample, and then you try and do some cribbing to fill the blanks. Um, and obviously, as you realize the same thing we did, is that the, the, the big problem with this is the huge cost that that comes with, right? It's not fantastically flexible. So this is more of a comment than it is than it is a question, because I think this is, you know, it, whoever has the answer really has a great paper coming. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but I think this is, this is really where, where maybe trying to investigate these meta-modeling approaches, uh, like the kind of stuff that Amir does, might, might be very helpful for these models. And it, I think a lot of the, of the work that we have to do is not so much the back end where we might have some Bayesian estimation method or something like that. It's really how do we manage that front end and that computational cost? Yeah, uh, I completely agree with, uh, with you um, that uh, this is a, I mean, that's, that's something that needs to be, to be done better. Uh, I mean, there are some papers around, as you were mentioning, you know, Sani and Francesco and so on, that it's something that I, I would be keen to try to apply on, on this kind of method, or whatever method, even I mean, simulated moments. On any any of these estimation method methods do need a way to explore the space, which is more efficient than this one, for example. Right. So yeah, I agree with you. Marco Pangallo. Um, hello. Can you go back to the slide uh, where you were showing the forecast, like uh, the, the probability of a recession, uh, uh, that one? So I was finding it very interesting that in 2020, there was no particular increase in probability of a recession. I mean, th there was somehow a peak around 2015, but then it didn't seem to be very high, despite, uh, you know, like the US had a lot of uh, super big growth. Do you have any intuition into why that's happening? So the Q1 2020 is the, so this thing here is actually the probability given Q4 9, 2019. So in this, in this picture here, I don't have the COVID uh, crisis. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I'm not talking about the COVID crisis. I just mean that it, it seems that the probability didn't go up much from 2012 yeah. uh, until 2020, while uh, in the previous cases, there was almost, almost always a monotonic increase in probability until the recession happened. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if uh, you can so comment I mean, on why uh, the model, or if you have any intuition on why the model is producing that result. So actually, mm, I think that this, I mean, uh, the fact that we just use output gap investment is not enough basically to characterize well in, in, a, in a good way the behavior of the economy. So we're going to we use output investment because it was kind of easy. We have just two variables and that makes uh, things easier from a computation point of view because this uh, forecast here actually computationally heavy because if you think about it, I have to compute the kernel density estimate, the kernel density, so the density for each point in time for 10,000 possible outcomes. So this is something that takes time. And for this reason, we uh, limited ourselves to output investment to show how it works. So I didn't get much into details about why and how this happened. What I can see is just that, uh, I don't know whether you're talking also about this kind of scare. So there are some, some peaks that are, some small peaks, even if these are still below 0 0.5, that are not followed by um, a crisis, I, I actually don't know what it means uh, in term, economic terms right now. I, I was just looking at, at these peaks here that, that looks nicely bef before the, uh, happened nicely before the crisis. But again, I'm not taking out from this anything more than, oh, it seems to work because, uh, I mean, we're using out the investment. We should probably, for example, for this crisis here also use something financial as we did with uh, Alessand. I don't know whether- Thanks, uh, maybe I'll send you an email to continue this offline. Yeah, Thank you. Nice. Thank you, Marco. Other questions from audience? If there are no more questions, let me thank again, Jakob, and close Thank the you. seminar. See you in two weeks for the next one. 
and yeah. have a nice day. Ciao. Bye bye. Bye bye.